this afternoon session uh, with Kristen Hall from Stony Brook University. Um, okay, take it away. Hello everybody, can everyone hear me? I tend to move, so if you can't hear me, just like wave at me and just go back. Um, so I'm just going to introduce myself. Um, so again, my name is Kristen Hall. Um, I currently work at Stony Brook University on Long Island. Um, so I'm kind of just around with the sound. Um, I um, am a library assessment and learning outcome specialist. So I think I have the longest title. Um, in our, well, actually, I probably don't. But um, my background, however, is not in libraries. Um, so I um, have my master's in academic advising. I was an academic advisor for about eight years, and I just transitioned over to the libraries last September. Um, so I do consider myself very much a novice when it comes to the libraries. Um, but while I was an academic advisor, I was in charge of our transfer seminar course. So that is very similar to the freshman seminars that you would see at universities and colleges, but it was designed specifically for transfer students at Stony Brook University. So we get a lot of um, transfer students from community colleges, so to kind of um, address those, those transfer issues. Um, so as part of that, I saw a lot of students struggling with the academic rigor of our classes. They were coming from courses that were about you know, 30 students max to chemistry with 500 of their best friends. Um, and so it was a very big transition for them. Um, so I saw a lot of struggle with that, and so that introduced me to um, researching a lot of study strategies and study skills which then you know, brought me into this whole realm of education and how, how we learn best. Um, so right now I'm currently pursuing my PhD in Curriculum, Instruction, and the Science of Learning, another long title, um, at the University of Buffalo. Um, and so this is kind of a lot of work that I'm doing within my PhD. Um, and then seeing how that relates in library instruction. Um, so I know there's a lot of struggle with this one-shot library instruction, so how do we, how do we work with that? Um, so a little bit about my, about my background. Um, oh, just a little side note, I'm kind of obsessed with puppies. You may see a lot of dogs in this presentation. i just obsessed with puppies. Um, so here are the presentation goals um, that I have for today. Um, so we're going to talk about meaningful learning. What does that actually mean? Um, and I'm going to explain the basics of Octavio's um, assimilation theory. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of students' prior knowledge. Why do we care about that? Um, we're going to talk about whether or not this can hinder or help um, future learning. Why library expertise could potentially be a hindrance um, when it comes to teaching um, and instruction. And then we're going to go over some strategies um, that librarians can use to assess students' um, prior knowledge. So I'm going to start with an activity because you know, this is instruction. Um, <laughs> So everybody should have a white piece of paper at their table. If you don't, I have a few extras here. Uh, just read away if you don't have a piece of paper to write on. Or everybody have. And it doesn't have to be this. It could be a scrap piece of paper that you have to. OK, so what I want you to do, so this activity is actually attributed to Ray Pun. He is uh, in, um, a first year um, success librarian. Um, at California State University, um, and he has some great ideas. So if you ever look him up on like LinkedIn or anything like that, or on Twitter, he's, he's awesome. Um, so what you're gonna do is you have five minutes, and without looking at uh, your computer or your phone or anything electronic, you are gonna draw um, your library website to your, spe to your specific school. So you can just focus on the home page, or if there's a specific page that you wanna focus on within your library web page. Um, you're going to have five minutes to draw your library web page. Okay? So think about, you know, library hours, locations, research, where would you find things, what do you want to find, all that kind of stuff. Okay? So you have five minutes. <laughs>
workshop.
construct anything that was below that first age yeah. goal. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things about this, I mean, granted, we're not going to necessarily like require everybody to memorize our websites. So when you're looking at your website, you're not going in with that intention. It's always going to be there, or you think it's always going to be there until you know it's down. IT is like hello. Um, <laughs> so like if you couldn't remember a lot, like don't beat yourself up over that because you you don't usually go in with that intention of having to memorize where everything is. Um, but this may be a good way to get students to realize like if they can't write anything down, like huh, you know maybe they don't know. You know maybe they should pay attention a little bit better. I'd add to that the other thing that occurred to me is that if I am having this much trouble after staring at it, um, like, I mean, I spent so much time on this site, I can't even remember what our menu items are, then how helpful is it when I'm telling students to just go to the menu and you'll see the links that matches the page? Exactly, that's my one of the points I was going to make. Um, <laughs> so that's the thing is that you're the experts, you know, you know how to navigate the website, now you bring a first year student in, and then we expect them just to know where things are. You know, so that's something else that you want to consider. The other thing too is that, you know, I'm always like I, I have this bookmark. I go to this straight old school. Students always Google it. They have to Google like, oh, you know, okay, I got to go to your web. Where is it? Yeah. If they're going to go to something like JSTOR, they just Google JSTOR. So like we have created all this architecture with all these links. It's like, do they get used? It's yeah. Like, and it's, so it's thinking about like how how are students actually really looking at these resources. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yep. And it's how we present that information to them of, of why they should be looking at the links or looking right. at other places rather than just Googling. I mean, they're all going to Google. That's, they're going to do that. But presenting other ways of what, look what you're missing because you're just Googling this one resource. So, any other thoughts? It made me realize where I focus on the website. Uh -huh. We have there's certain things on there that I'm using all the time. And I can't remember. I know there's a bunch of things underneath it that I just I don't use much at all, so I can't remember what they are. Yep. But there's basically four things on there I know that I use a lot and yep. that I show students a lot. Yeah. So how many of you want to go onto your website right now to be like, what was over here? <laughs> <laughs> over there? So this is just a good kind of activity to get that activating of that prior knowledge to see. Because we um, as I'll talk about a little bit later, we're Really bad at self-assessing. Um, so this just kind of forces you to be able to do that. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about meaningful learning um, and kind of where this comes from. So a lot of these educational theories kind of all link together, um, kind of branches off. Um, but one of the ones I chose to uh, focus on is Osterfeld's assimilation learning theory. Um, so really the basis of his learning theory is relating information to what you already know. Okay, so the example that I give students all the time, um, I try to talk in terms of like their classes. We're a very science um, heavy based at school. So I say, if you take Health 1, would you then jump to Health 3? And they're like, no, of course not. I'm like, exactly. I'm like, because you're missing that higher knowledge, that, those pre that prerequisite in Health 2. It makes sense. So, but that doesn't always make sense to them in other you know, um, areas like history or something. It's like, no, you shouldn't skip this stuff because you're going to be missing that base knowledge. You're not going to be able to relate that new information to what you already know, okay? So, Osterfeld's learning theory, I'm going to attempt to explain the basics to you, because as you can see from here, it's really complicated. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to go into this. Um, there was um, um, a researcher, um, Joseph Novak, who is one of the, there's a lot of different things like concepts. So this is a concept map. Um, so you'll see them as like mind maps or kind of other versions of that, but he was kind of one of the developers of the concept map, and this is what he had to say. It took me more than three years and six seminars in which Osterfeld's work was emphasized before I began to feel comfortable interpreting his theory to others. So I'm not gonna talk about this, we're just gonna talk about a little portion of it because it's really complicated. Um, so what you really wanna think about when you talk about meaningful learning is it has three requirements. So. Um, one of it is what well, the information that you're presenting needs to be meaningful. Um, so if we think about an example of, you know, if I gave you the words short, pencil, fire extinguisher, trees, coffee, doorknob, does that mean anything? No. <laughs> oh, there you go. So you had a way to incorporate it together. But if you're if you're taking 
information and it's not um, kind of communicated in some sort of meaningful way, it kind of gets lost. Um, so you want to be able to be presenting information that has some sort of associations or that can be uh, meaningful together. So for example, tree, branches, leaves, flowers, birds, forest, squirrel, deer. You know, those have some sort of relation to it. So something meaningful in a meaningful way. The other thing is uh, the learner's prior knowledge. So this is really what we want to talk about today is the importance of that learner's prior knowledge. If they don't have some basis to then hook on, or what they call anchor on that new information, it's gonna be lost. This is where students will then resort to memorizing, and so that's what we call rote learning. Um, so you'll see that off on the side over here. Um, and if they're not making it meaningful, if they're not looking to understand form associations, they're not gonna be able to hook that information onto information they already know, it's gonna be lost. So if you ever heard students, this one student, he was really funny, um, I don't even know what class it was for. I think it was some sort of math class. I was like, oh, how'd that math class go? He was, um, that math test go? He was like, I don't know. And I was like, what do you mean you don't know? He's like, I took the test. I left the test. It's like, etch a sketch. It's all gone. And I was like, well, that's not good. <laughs> so I can guarantee you he didn't really engage in meaningful learning there. Um, he's really just looking at, you know, what do I need to know for the test? Let's look, memorize it, memorize the formula, input it, however we need to solve it but I have no idea what it means, okay? So that's what we call that rote learning. Um, so the learner's prior knowledge is really important, the, uh, the kind of material, how, how it's presented, and then also a huge part is the learner has to choose to do this. So you could be great and giving everything and a great structure and all forming associations, all that, and a student has the base knowledge, but if they're not choosing, to then engage and incorporate that material so that they're forming that new understanding is not gonna work. So it is you know, very much the relationship between the student um, and the instructor. So if you feel like some students are just not getting it, you not all be on your fault. Um, it's, it's really the learner has to choose um, to be able to process that information as well. Um, but that's really the big thing is what is their prior knowledge and how are they anchoring? So those are the words that Osibel learns uh, uses. How are they anchoring that new information onto information that they already know? Um, so Osibel talks about knowledge organization. Um, so he believes it's a very um, integrated system. So if we kind of go back to that example I gave with the list of words, um, which I'll show you in a little bit on how we're organizing information. Um, so say we had forest, we had that word. You know, then we're able to then take tree, and we're able to take leaves, and we're able to then incorporate that into forest. So we're kind of assimilating that information in. So you could have the word tree, but not have the word forest yet. But then you're, if you're learning the word forest, now we're talking about probably like five-year-olds, not like college students, but very simple. <laughs> if you're taking that word forest, now they can assimilate that into that new information, okay? But if they have never seen a tree before, they never had an association with a tree, you know, it's gonna be a lot harder for them to understand it. Does that make sense? Um, so another book that I'm gonna um, recommend kind of at the end, it's a book called How Learning Works. It's phenomenal. Um, it's by Ambrose. And what he said is that people make, naturally make associations based on patterns they experience in the world. So we're always trying to put things into categories. We're always trying to form associations to order things no matter what we're doing. Okay, so that's one of the things when we're trying to present information, we wanna to try to do this in a way that kind of makes sense or try to organize that information for the students. When we have very organized structures, it's a lot easier for us to be able to retain information and be able to then recall that information later. Um, if it's kind of disorganized and you're kind of all over the place and you don't really know what's going on, it's a lot harder to then simulate that new information, to anchor that new information on and to then recall it. And that's when students are tending to go more into that rote learning, where they're just memorizing it, let's get it for the test, and then etch a sketch is gone afterwards. Um, so what Osterwell says is that students' current knowledge is the most important factor. So again, you could be you know, providing the information in a very organized, structured way, very meaningful way, and they can choose to do that, but if they have no basis to anchor on that knowledge to, if they don't have that prereq, if they're taking Calc 3 when they didn't take Calc 2, they're not gonna be able to assimilate that new information. They're gonna have a big gap um, that they have to fill. 
So this is kind of a typical just organization of what we call a concept map. Um, so the example that I gave before, so when we talk about we have a forest, then we're breaking that down into trees or animals, and then the trees have leaves and flowers and branches, and you know, kind of how things are relating to each other. Now, if I were to draw a map and you were to draw a map, they may be very different, but that doesn't mean that they're wrong. It's just the way that I'm organizing the information versus the way you are. And you may want to be focusing on a specific area. So this, I have forest at the top. But what if I am really focusing on birds? You know, but they could live in a forest and live in a tree, so they can be below that. So it's kind of like what concept is um, kind of that overarching concept that you're focusing on. So here we have prior knowledge. So this influences how students interpret their new information. So this is where it can be either helpful or it can be a hindrance um, and not helpful for students going forward. So this is kind of where it's a hindrance. You know, when that dog chews that cat couch up, it's not very good. Um, so this is where it's not helpful. Um, and then where it can be helpful. This is one of our, our pet therapy dogs that we have in the library during the end of the semester. And there's one blue line out the door of students, you know, wanting to pet the dogs, me included. Um, so this is, you know, just an example of how it can be helpful. It's all your like puppies. So um, when prior knowledge is hindrance, so these are three different things um, to think about. Um, so the prior knowledge is inactive. Um, so they may have it, but maybe we didn't activate that prior knowledge. Maybe they don't see that connection that you're making or how that prior knowledge is connected to what you're telling them to do or the new information you're giving them. Um, so we would call that inactive. It could be insufficient. So they could be lacking it altogether. Um, so why do we have math placement exams when students come as freshmen? Why do we have writing placement exams? It's to kind of see where they're at. So hopefully they're placed into a class where they don't experience that gap in knowledge. And then it also could be inappropriate or inaccurate. It could be plain wrong. So students, you know, are like, all I need is Google and that's it and I'm good. Um, that's all I need to do in order to search for anything that I need. I don't need databases, you know. Inaccurate, not good, misconception. Um, so this is where we have the basis for misconceptions. A really common misconception um, that I have in the learning sciences um, is learning styles. So I don't know if any of you've heard of uh, learning styles, but it's a very big misconception that learning styles help you, knowing your learning style helps you become a better learner. It does not. Um, and it's misconceptions are really, really, really hard to change. So when prior knowledge is helpful, so when you are able to get this information to be activated, so there is sufficient prior knowledge and the students are using that to make those new connections. Um, and this is where they're drawing on that information, they're constructing their own knowledge, basis of constructivism um, that, you know, that theory really um, is within education right now. Um, it is sufficient, so there's enough of it. Um, and it relates um, to the new learning, so it is appropriate and it is accurate. So you don't have to worry about trying to change those. So where this inaccurate prior knowledge can be hindrance, um, so students will just ignore what you're saying because they think they already know what they need to know. Um, so if you have those students who are in your instruction classes and then they're on their phone and they just kind of check out, I don't need to pay attention because I already know how to do this. Um, so that's where you may have, you know, come into these, um, these issues. So they just kind of like, I don't need to, I'm good, <coughs> Google or whatever database that they always go to, not even realizing the resources that we have available. Um, so again, misconceptions really, really hard to change. Um, there are a bunch of re uh, reputation studies out there that even when you provide evidence of how this is inaccurate and you provide the evidence that shows that is what is accurate, you still, uh, people tend to go back to their misconceptions. Um, even if you are able to convince them otherwise, they may hold that belief for a little bit, but often then they revert back to what the misconception is. Um, stereotypes fall into this as well. Um, so when we talk about stereotypes, it is misconceptions. Um, so what's hard about misconceptions is some of the things are correct, or some of the time, um, but it's obviously not all the time. So that's when people hold those beliefs all the time. 
Um, so if you find some misconceptions or that you're identifying misconceptions when you're doing these activities for uh, assessing students' prior knowledge, just realize that you're not going to be able to change their minds overnight. Um, and even if you feel like you are, you're providing the evidence to show that this is not correct, um, you're planting seeds. So that's where, you know, hopefully one day, you know, they'll get it. Um, but just think about it as you're planting seeds. So we're going to talk a little bit about novice um, and expert and the difference between that. So when we think about organization of knowledge um, and thinking about, you know, also assimilation theory, so well-organized knowledge around concepts is very easily retained and very easily to be able to recall. Um, so if you think about a nicely organized library. Um, so that's kind of where we're thinking of experts. So you as experts and librarians, your information is very well-organized. When we think of students, it probably looks something like this. Um, so very much novice. Um, so they may have some of that basic knowledge, but they don't, you know, it's not organized in any way for them to be able to retrieve it in a, in a good way. Um, so experts, so this is where being a librarian can potentially hurt you. Um, so it's something that we call expert blind spot. Um, so this is when you are so efficient in what you do that you're blind to the beginning stages of what students, um, where students are. So this is where you tend to overestimate students' prior knowledge. So you think they know more than they do, or they pretend they do. Um, and then you underestimate the time it takes to complete a task, because for you, it's so efficient, it's second nature. Um, so this is where it can be difficult. And the reasoning behind this is a lot to do with chunking of knowledge. Experts are a lot better at organizing and chunking large amounts of material um, so that you're able to make associations and store that information better. Um, students and novices don't necessarily do that. So where you're having easy access to that information, so if you look back to the library, you know, it's very well organized. You kind of have all your education books together, all your sociology books together. Students just kind of throw them on, on the racks. <laughs> so, um, you're much be able, uh, better able to chunk that information together. And so what we call this is unconscious competence. So you are very confident in what you do, but you're not aware of it, okay? Um, so when we talk about developing mastery, it's kind of this chart here. So students tend to be, especially first year students, tend to be in this unconscious incompetence. So what that means is that they are not aware that they don't know what they're doing. Um, they're not aware of all that they have to learn. So eventually, hopefully, they get that aha moment, and they come to this point where they're aware that I don't know what I'm doing. So what do I need to do in order to get that knowledge? So hopefully, they're working hard, they put in some effort to learn new material so that they can get to that conscious competence part so that they are aware and they are now competent in it. However, as we continue on and you become an expert in a certain area, you then become unconscious competent. So now you kind of feel like, or you're just not aware of your own expertise and thinking that everybody has the same base knowledge as you do. So this is also called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, so this is what I was talking about before about self-assessing. That we're really bad at self-assessing, so experts, tend to underestimate their abilities. So they tend to um, not really have as much belief in their abilities because they kind of think everybody else has the same abilities. So they don't really see themselves as experts. And then you have novices who are way over um, confident in what they're doing because they're just not even aware that they don't have the ability. So when we talk about self-assessing, most people are really bad at self-assessing them on both ends. So when we talk about the role of the instructor, so what do you do with all of this? Um, so one of the things is reflecting on your own level of knowledge. So this is where concept maps, a lot of people are scared of them. Um, I did a lot of research on them uh, recently and they're really, really helpful. Um, the reason why I feel like people are scared of them is because they don't know how to do them. Um, or when they start to do them, as we did this you know, little activity before, it's having to be able to recall that information and feeling like you don't know anything. Um, but as you kind of work on them, they get, they get a bit easier. So self-assess, draw your own concept maps. Do activities like we did before, where you're drawing your maps so that you can see your own level of expertise. 
Um, and then if you have your students do the same thing, you know it's really hard doing a one-shot session, you know, having them draw a concept map, or to teach them how to draw a concept map, but if you have the pleasure of having a, like a semester-long class, this may be an activity you want to do, is then having them do concept maps and compare your maps. Kind of see how your structure and your organization of knowledge is very, very different. So we're talking a little bit more about strategies to assess students' prior knowledge. Um, you really want to be mindful of trying to activate students' prior knowledge. Um, so I know that I had asked a question before, um, you know, where do you find yourself on the website? Um, the like, like, where would you look for a librarian on the website? And I've heard like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, let me look at that, let me write that down on, on the website. So I had to prompt that, I had to ask that question. So it's not that you don't know that, like you all know where you know you are on the website, but sometimes you just have to ask those prompting questions to be able to um, get students to activate that prior knowledge. So asking, what do you already know about this topic? What do you already know about how to search for you know scholarly articles? Um, so hopefully getting them engaged with that. Once you're able to assess their prior knowledge, helping to fill those gaps. Um, so you know again, probably doing one shot instruction, probably just focusing on one topic. Um, so to be able to look into hopefully fill in those gaps of knowledge. Um, and then if you are able to identify any misconceptions, you know, planting those seeds to try to correct them, realizing you're not going to be able to correct them in 55 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes. It's not going to work. So here are some strategies. Um, so when we're looking at assessing prior knowledge, um, these are very basic. So they don't need to be like really elaborate activities. They can be very, very basic activities. So the activity we did, we did before, so drawing a map. Um, so this can be of the website. You can ask them to draw a map of the library space, you know, where do you study on campus, um, the research process. So what do you do when you're um, starting to search for an article or start your research you know, paper? Drawing kind of like a flow chart or an outline for that. Or if there's some sort of concept that you want them to know, you know, drawing a concept map or um, drawing uh, a map or something of that concept. Think, pair, share. Does everybody know what think, pair, share is? I use this all the time. If my students are quiet and like I can hear crickets, I throw a, ooh, there you go. I throw a think, pair, share at them. And that always gets them engaged. Um, so it can just be some sort of, you know, activating question that you want to ask, um, a debate kind of question, you know, one to two minutes, think for yourselves, pair it up, and then share with the class. It always gets them talking. And this is where you then, while they're in the pair, you can always walk around the classroom to kind of get a sense of what students are talking about. Most often that's when I'm able to identify like, oh, we need to address that, oh, that's not correct, or oh yeah, look, they're really working on this area, let me emphasize this. So that's where you're going to get that assessing. Um, trivia games or scavenger hunts. Um, so when I was um, talking with Ray Pun, he also does an escape room activity which I thought was really cool. Um, so kind of thinking about what are students kind of trending now um, and what would be fun. So if you wanted to design some sort of escape room, um, that would be cool. Um, but some sort of trivia game or scavenger hunt, thinking about providing them a structure. Um, research has shown that like since we're you know experts in this room within librarians, so you are, I'm not, but <laughs> experts within libraries, Providing them a structure for them to work on, on how they should be organizing their knowledge is really helpful for them. Instead of throwing information at them and requiring them to be able to organize that information. So kind of that scaffold, thinking of that scaffolding. If you're working with four stu uh, first year students, they probably need a little bit more structure than higher level students. Um, Pre-assessment, I'm really a big fan of this. I understand how difficult that this could be. But if you're able to do it, so should. Um, so this can be a very short survey or questionnaire that you're giving students prior to your one-shot instruction session. So this definitely requires collaboration with faculty that you're meeting with. Um, but if that can be administered through Blackboard or a Qualtrics survey or something to give you some information about how to tailor your one-shot instruction session. Um, really, really helpful. I feel like it's really difficult to implement. But this is something that I think would give you the most information that you're looking for in order to be able to um, design your, your session going forward. You can ask students to demonstrate. So if there's something that you want them to do, you can have the student come to the front, or you can have them draw on the board, or just simply asking questions, you know, show me how you do this. 
and that will um, identify you know, certain areas or gaps in knowledge as well. And this is something I'm really a big fan of as well, is judgment of learning. So again, as I said before, we're really bad at self-assessing. Um, so if students are giving you an answer about something, you can just go back at it. How do you know that? How confident are you in your answer? And then that gets students to really assess, do I really know what, I'm, what I know? Um, sometimes they're completely right, you know, but getting them that confidence of, yes, I am right, or maybe I should rethink this, or where did I get this information from? Um, so very, very simple. If you're doing this on a pre-assessment, you can always just do um, like a scale, you know, have them answer the question, and then how confident are you in your answer? Does anybody have any questions before we go on to the short answer? No? Okay. Um, so if we can just get into, I mean, you can, I said three to five, and you guys can just go to your table since we're all at tables now. Um, and kind of thinking back on, um, so I'll put the strategies back up, but thinking about the different assessment strategies, pre-assessment that, that I discussed. How can you use that in your current um, school? Um, so again, I know these are basic, um, but and every school is very different in the way that they approach things. So how can you use this information in your program, um, or how can you adapt it? You know, can you create something else from this? Can you um, do something going forward with this information? So kind of take about five or um, five or ten minutes to kind of discuss with at your table and see how you could use or adapt these strategies or anything that we kind of talked about. Um, and the presentation. We tend to do the trivia game scavenger hunt kind of model as much as possible in the front of the world. I don't think it's used to its full ability or thought out as well as it could be, but it's effective for us. I've been doing something that's fairly traditional in the sense that I have a follow-up exercise after my lecture. But this is making me think that all those things that I raised, this is making me think that somehow if I could put that on more of the front end. So instead of me saying, you know, what's the, in other words, a lot of the answers that I ask, or some of them, some of them, some are either right or wrong. I'm just, it's, the title is there's nothing. But I mean, sometimes they'll say, why do you select this data? And they'll give an answer, you know, the evidence basically. So it, this makes me think that maybe I should be introducing some of that um, whole idea that's part of the rigor of academics. Really, so you're, you're giving evidence. You're not just you know, spouting off some, something to know. Well, the first thing I saw, I thought it'd be easier. You know, I'm just thinking some of those aren't appropriate answers. So I feel like I should run in a little bit. And especially if you get a couple, I like your idea about Google survey. If you could get that information a couple days ahead of time, even just to tailor the list of questions. I know because I was reading something recently, and just a student body told me that I wonder if they use my own because they probably don't ever get back to you. I mean, I'm sure they've seen that, you know what I mean? Like, 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 which they really know about the difference in the difference. I love the idea of how confident are you. I think that'll immediately make them be like, oh. <laughs> and it'll be interesting to see if, if there are really inaccurate things that someone's so confident about. How you would address that in a course? Yeah, that's, that's that's exactly what I would what, yeah. what I was saying. Like I would want to do stuff like that because because yeah. there is that overconfidence. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not. I don't know enough to know that I don't. Yeah. I, I, really I mean, like yeah. Because that's a tricky thing. You have to figure out how you're going to address that without telling them you're so wrong. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you want them to really realize it's not tell. You are correct. You want them to be like, oh, I thought that way, but what you said makes more sense. Yeah. <laughs> I find that the pre-assessment is really hard. Uh, that we, we've done things like that, not, not with this particular objective in mind, but we've done. It's very hard to, to minimize.
administer. Yeah. I'm working on pre-assessment for something that my colleagues do more than I am, but it's, it's, it is that question of like, okay, the they're, they're getting just freaked out by the pre-assessment. Like they want to get the pre-assessment correct. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. We're looking things up, and uh -huh. then, yeah. uh, then when they do the post-assessment, there's no change because they look stuff up in the pre-assessment. So it's like, you know, we just, want just to know what we know right now. It's very hard to impart that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 This is a perfect. Yeah. I've done a digital polling, like right before, but they're not looking anything up just to kind of assess their comfort level with this topic we're going to talk about. Like, do you know what this thing is? Do you know what it is, but do you know how to find it? Just kind of ranking so I know where it's kind of focused and like be prepared to go in really the direction. direction. Some dialogue. Um, first year, like very instruction um, classes you do. It's a lot of fun. It's like, but it's just like it's they like to get to crawl. Like just very basic. Like is this true or false? We don't have any computers at all. Like you know, it's like that.
gaps of what they're missing or like, oh, I didn't, so if one group is talking like, oh, you know, we found this here and then another group's like, oh, I didn't even know that that was there. You know, so that way they're, they're engaging and teaching each other and they're not always hearing. You know, we would learn how they use our website, you know, maybe yes, are yes. they finding the discovery tool or do they see that thing that says database and then they find the subject guide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah um, I would suggest definitely like a structured, you know, trivia sheet or scavenger hunt sheet or something for them to follow, you know, with specific maybe prompting questions that you would want them to, to do instead of just being like, go to our website, have fun. And like, okay. Uh, <laughs> so sometimes the, you know, that, that structure of guidance would be helpful. Okay. Yes. This was kind of fast backwards, but it was kind of a self-reporting uh, survey at the end of an English 101 class to ask, uh, in, in, in a sense, it was asking, do you remember anything from the freshman seminar? Uh -huh. but, but it was also just immediately right after that, the one shot asking, what was most new to you? And yes. also asking, what was the single most useful thing you learned today? Yeah. So mm -hmm. that, that was interesting in that you could see, well, they came in not knowing what this was and, and what this was mm -hmm. called and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So that was kind of, you know, it's one possible kind of assessment. Yeah, yeah. And that can also be done at the, like an end of the class too. That can be done in the beginning. So we, we call them like, um, well I know from where we call them like ticket, ticket out the door or ticket in the door. So sometimes that ticket in the door, you know, can help um, to kind of assess that, that prior knowledge and then ticket out the door is what, what was one thing that you learned today. Or... Anybody else? Want to share anything? Yeah, I So as librarian, one of the things, one of our primary, often one of our primary responsibilities is to teach search and retrieval um, you know, in our databases and our different tools and whatnot. And one of the things that I find is that um, often when we're invited into the classroom by faculty, we're actually skipping several different steps in the inquiry process, moving right ahead to that. So our first year seminar really deals with um, the process of inquiry and where our students learn how to do is ask questions and deal with messy problems. So one of the things that we're doing um, is, we call it issue mapping, which essentially is concept mapping. Uh -huh. And uh, we're giving them, you know, they practice this throughout the semester. So they're actually set up pretty well by the time we get in the classroom. But we go through that process, we issue map, uh, and we talk about the different uh, um, lenses and different ways in which you can look at complex problems and map it all out. So it gives them a chance to map out the prior knowledge identify the different gaps of what they need to know. And then they all have map, they have it mapped out, right? They have keywords identified, different concepts, different ideas that they can use to then generate um, you know, keyword searches and look for different information. So you know, that's actually one of my biggest concerns about a librarian. I'm really worried about how our students are underprepared in that uh, you know, those initial stages of inquiry and asking questions and learning to understand the problem what it is that they already need to know. What they already know and what it is that they need to know. You know, often, particularly content courses, you know, there's a, uh, you know, they're, they're learning content throughout the course and then there's a research project slapped on the end of it. Yeah. And sometimes the only instruction they get in inquiry is that search and retrieval when they've actually never learned how to ask questions to begin with. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's also, um, if you're able to develop those collaborative relationships with faculty, ideally, you know, to scaffold that in the beginning of the semester. So they're constantly thinking about that. You know, their research paper may be due at the end of the semester, but do they have prompts throughout the semester to, to start that process? Um, so if you're able to work with the faculty to get them to incorporate that, that would be great. Um, but I know it's a challenge, so. But I, I totally agree with you. In the credit bearing information literacy course, that uh, one of the first assignments that I had students do was to map and draw a picture of their, their research process, what they went through, and that some of them were pretty interesting. And we were talking about it, you know, we had discussed it in the class, and the students would pick out things that I didn't see, and probably because of my unconscious comments. Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So it was a really neat discussion. Yeah, 
I think, um, so if you do have a semester long course, yeah, um, I think that it's like the, con I'm really a big believer in concept maps, but if you have them start the very first week of like doing a uh, project similar to that, and then if you have them do one mid semester, and then you have one do at the end of the semester, they now can see how they learned throughout the semester, like how the organization of their knowledge was in the beginning, and then now how it is at the end. Um, so I think that's a really helpful visual for students to see like, oh wow, I learned a lot, I didn't utilize that. So it's a really, that's a really great activity. We don't get it for most classes though. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it really depends on kind of where you're starting with the concept map. So you can use it as kind of a pre-assessment. You can also use it as a final assessment. Um, what I would have students do is just start. So take, you know, the research process or take like how to search for an article or, you know, if there's a, a, their topic that they're researching, you know, whatever topic that is. Um, so what you have them do is you first have them generate like all the concepts and words that relate to that concept. Um, so if we take something like, you know, just the library, the library at your school. What is every word that you could possibly think of that, that kind of relates to the library? So I have the library or like library locations or something along those lines. Like we have, I think, six or seven libraries within our university. Um, so you can start off with library, the library, and I'm being very general right now, so <laughs> the library has books, um, the library has study spaces, the library has librarians, uh, there are students there, there are newspaper articles, any concept that you can think of that goes with that, and then you have the students sit and organize that information. So what's at the very top um, is you want it to be hierarchical, so you'll see some mind maps where it like starts in the middle and you kind of branch out. Um, but I think the hierarchical one is a little bit better. So you start with the most basic concept at the top, so it'll be library, and then you have things branch off. So um, where you're having those branches is where you describe the relationship. So if we go back, um, let me find one that, we go back to the meaningful learning one. So this is a concept map. Um, so the very top is the meaningful learning. So this then requires you to have learner's prior knowledge, meaningful learner, and then the learner chooses. Um, and then you can see where things are all linked together. So all of these links, they can go both, um, you know, both ways. They can be linked off to other things. Um, this is where you start to see the relationships between concepts. Um, as students do this and they start, they're very, usually very simple. Um, and then as you learn something or you know something really well, they can get very complex. Um, so I, um, I did a paper on concept maps this semester and I actually did a concept map on concept maps. And <laughs> it was so big that I was like, I can't include this as part of my paper because it was just getting like so complicated. Um, but as you learn more, then you'll be able to add more relationships. This is also a good study tool. So um, if you're any, any sort of study strategies or anything like that with students, so say they have a concept within chemistry or math or history or something that they need to learn, um, this is a good self-testing tool. So they can start with the same concept and then just draw, what do I know? What do I know about this, this um, area? And then they can then identify the gaps that they have in knowledge. Now I need to go back and study this area because I don't know it that well. Um, so, and there's no, necessarily wrong way to do it and if I were to do a concept map on concept maps and you would do they look different um, it's just the way that I organized it in my in my head versus you so but this really helps you to see do I know this do I not know this um, do we need to kind of go back a little bit but it starts with that most overarching um, concept and then all the things that you find that relate to it and then the relationships between them does that answer your question? There's lots of books on it. Um, I really like Joseph Novak. There are other um, um, kind of like I feel like mind mapping is another one that you'll see. Joseph Novak um, worked at Cornell with the research team, um, and they're the ones who kind of developed this idea of concept maps. There are um, computer um, software programs like online that you can use for free to create maps. They're pretty easy to use. So.
And they take time. So that's where students don't like. It takes time and effort. That's what studying takes time and effort, and they don't really like that. But, um, but it's, they're, if you really want to engage in meaningful learning, that's definitely um, where, where, where to go. So I think I'm out of time. But I just wanted to show you um, uh, some resources. There's these two books that I think are great. Um, How Learning Works. Um, a lot of what I got from about prior knowledge um, from this presentation comes from this book, How Learning Works. Um, it's geared towards um, faculty, um, college faculty. Um, and they also talk a lot about like diversity, like who your learner is, how to set up a class, like um, how to teaching strategies for the classroom, um, as well as assessing students' prior knowledge and why that is important, why, why you should know that. Another book is called Make It Stick. This is a lot about um, what is a really good way to study um, versus what you think is really good. Um, so this is um, based, and these both book, books are both based on the learning science research. So they're written for mainstream, but they are based on learning science research. So these are these are my two favorite um, that I recommend, and they're pretty easy to read. So if anybody has any other questions? Available, um, Thank you. Thank you very much.